We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. It's often said that necessity is the mother of invention. Or you might say necessity and desire are the parents of invention. Well, anyway, that's sort of what motivated today's project. Now, I love outdoor cooking, but when it came to a place to prep my food, I've always been, well, space challenged. So I decided to take matters into my own hands and come up with the perfect grilling prep station. It's portable, versatile, and roomy. In other words, perfect for the outdoor chef and all of us. You know, I love outdoor cooking, but I hate this makeshift food preparation area. So I'm gonna ask my friend Rick Peters to design a solution for me. So Rick, what do you say? Can you improve on this? This is really pretty cool. This is a grilling prep station. And first of all, it's portable. It's got wheels down here on the bottom and a handle over on this end so I can move it wherever I want to. Down on this end, there's a tray for condiments and under here is a holder for paper towels. The bottom shelf is situated low enough so that I can put a cooler on that. And then one of the things I really like about this is right up here is an insert into which a carving board will drop. So I could prepare my food in the kitchen, bring it out, set it right in the cart. So any way you slice it, this is a grilling prep station for a serious outdoor cook. I'm going to build this project almost entirely out of cedar. It's a bit pricey, but lightweight, ideal for outdoor use, and a real pleasure to work with. Since several of the parts I'll be cutting have identical dimensions, I'm using a stop block on my power miter saw. It eliminates the need to measure each time and guarantees I'll end up with pieces that are precisely the same length whether I need to cut two or twenty. Now this is every single piece of wood I'm going to need to build this mobile grill prep station. I was able to do all of my cutting at one time. Now I can start assembling. I'm going to start by building the frame for the lower shelf. It consists of a front, back, and two ends. Duct tape will hold the corners in position until I can attach them permanently. This combination drill and driver will come in especially handy for this project because I'll be drilling a whole lot of countersunk pilot holes into which I'll be driving scores of corrosion resistant decking screws. With the frame complete, I begin attaching the deck boards. First, boring pilot holes, then driving in weatherproof screws. With the lower shelf pretty much complete, I set it out of the way. The upper frame is made up mainly of two rails. I clamp the rails together and bore a three-quarter inch hole through both pieces at the same time. Next, I separate them, cut two miters on one end, and using an oscillating spindle sander, 
shape this part of the rail into a sort of half circle. Then I sand off the sharp edges. Attached to the rails will be four legs. Through two of the legs, I drill half-inch holes that will hold the axle for the wheels. Then I set the legs in position, clamp them in place, and check to see that they're perpendicular to the rails. When I'm satisfied, I secure them with three-inch screws. Now, at this point, I'm building the project upside down on the workbench. I drop in the lower shelf, allowing it to rest on temporary support blocks I've attached to the inside of the legs. I clamp the shelf frame to the legs and permanently attach it with more three-inch rust-proof screws. Now I can flip the prep station right side up. It's clearly beginning to take shape. To complete the structural part, I insert the upper end rails and screw them in place. Now, remember those holes I drilled into the ends of the rails? Well, they will hold this piece of three-quarter inch dowel that will serve as the lifting handle. I mark the link, cut the dowel, insert it in place, then drill pilot holes through the rail and drive in short screws to lock the handle in place. The axle for the wheels is made from a piece of half-inch steel rod I picked up from the Home Improvement Center and am cutting to length. I insert the rod through the holes in the ends of the legs, slip on a washer, a wheel, and finally an axle cap that gets tapped onto the end. I've left the end pieces of decking on the lower shelf until now because they needed to be notched around the legs. And that should finish the base. To avoid any sharp edges, I'm going to draw a radius on the corners, cut off the excess material, and use the spindle sander to create a safe, smooth, rounded shape. The prep station is designed to include a drop-in cutting board. Now, rather than build the carving board from scratch, I found a stock size online. So the way this is going to work is we're going to drop this in between a couple of rails and in effect we're going to build the top around the carving board. Something like this. I'm going to connect the rails to the slats using something called biscuit joinery. This plate joiner has a rotating cutter that will make precise slots first in the side rails and then in the ends of the slats. The cutter is designed to make sure the slots are straight and always the same distance from the top of any matching pieces. Next, I put water-resistant glue in the slots, then press in these compressed discs of wood called biscuits. I use a brush to distribute whatever glue has squeezed out, 
Then put glue in the slots I cut in the ends of the slats. And press the slats into place. From this angle, it's easy to see how the biscuits keep everything aligned. Then I repeat the process on the other side. First applying glue, then inserting biscuits, and finally setting the opposite rail in place. Now I drop the whole assembly into a couple of bar clamps, tighten, add a couple more clamps, then snug everything up while the glue dries. A few hours later, after removing the clamps, I use a random orbit sander to eliminate any ridges or dry glue, making the surface smooth to the touch. Next, I use a router with a roundover bit to machine a 3 8 inch radius around the edge of the top. Then, I do my finish sanding with a palm sander and 150 grit paper. The carving board will fit into this opening in the top, no doubt about that. And these support slats are what will keep it flush with the surface. The top is finished and the base is just about done. Now it's time to marry the two pieces together. Once again, countersunk pilot holes and three inch weather resistant screws will do the trick. Now for a couple of handy accessories. Paper towels are a real necessity when it comes to cooking outdoors and this dispenser will keep them close at hand. And finally, a condiment tray to keep salt, pepper, spices and sauces well within reach. A thorough shaking ensures that the color pigments in this combination stain sealer get evenly distributed. Before starting, I like to pour the finish into a container small enough to hold in my hand. I brush with the grain using long straight strokes to work the finish well into the surface. I begin at the top and move downward to catch any drips as I go. A stain sealer like this one does three things. First, it helps keep water from penetrating the wood fibers. Second, sealers like this one have a built-in filter that helps block damaging ultraviolet rays that can deteriorate wood cells. And third, stains add color to the wood, evening out variations in tone and shade. Well, I think I got just about everything I wanted. Paper towels close at hand, a cooler within easy reach, grilling tools at the ready, and condiments where I can get my hands on them. Everything a guy could want in a grilling prep station. Well, plus maybe a couple of sirloins. Now when it comes to refinishing, you usually don't think of using water, but the fact is that all of these products over here, uh, sealers, stains, and top coats are water-based. Not only are they lower in toxicity and easy to clean up, but they can produce some really nice results. Every top-notch finishing job starts with good surface preparation. When I'm hand sanding, I use 220 grit paper and move with the grain in straight, even strokes. Most of the time, though, I use a palm sander. 
It's fast and pretty much eliminates the risk of cross-grain scratches. A paper towel does a good job of picking up the last bit of sawdust. Before using the stain, I give it a good stirring to thoroughly distribute any pigment that may have settled to the bottom. A synthetic bristle brush is my tool of choice for applying this stain. Because the stain is water-based, I would avoid using a brush with natural bristles. I lay the stain out evenly, working with the grain. A piece of cheesecloth or a soft cotton rag is ideal for wiping off the excess stain. On this side of the board, I'm wiping after five minutes. On the opposite side, I've waited 15 minutes before wiping. The longer the stain is left, the deeper the color. Dry brushing is another technique. The brush picks up excess stain, which is then unloaded onto a cloth pad. This method creates a more opaque effect that can help conceal irregular wood grain or color. Stains can produce a blotchy appearance on some softwoods like pine. To avoid this, I often use a pre-stained conditioner. This water-based version partially seals the wood, enabling the stain to penetrate more uniformly and wipe off more evenly. Water-based stains dry quickly. In two to three hours, they're ready to top coat. I usually half fill a one quart container so that I can gently tap the brush on the sides to remove excess material. I flow out the top coat in the direction of the grain. Whenever I can, I finish with long, straight, overlapping strokes, a technique called striking off. In between top coats, I sand with 220 grit paper and dust thoroughly. When I'm finished, the cleanup will be soap and water. So, for your next refinishing project, you might want to consider water. Cheers. You know, most folks think their garage door opener is working properly if they push the button and the door goes up and down. But there's one more important factor. Garage door openers are equipped with a safety feature that stops the door and reverses it when it encounters resistance, like a child or a pet. Now here's a simple test you can make to be sure that your door is adjusted properly. Start the door down, put an unopened roll of paper towels underneath it. The bottom of the door should contact the paper towels, compress it slightly, stop, and then reverse. If it doesn't, your door needs to be adjusted. You can do that yourself by checking your owner's manual or call a professional. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com, where you'll find hundreds of how-to videos available 24-7. Free home improvement videos online 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.